Yeah, there's a lot going on in the United States, right? So there's a legacy of structural racism that's been impacting black communities in the United States ever since we were kidnapped from Africa and brought to the United States. And so what we're seeing today is actually a continuation of the racist policies and practices of the United States. We're seeing state-sanctioned violence um, with impunity on black people. And the reality is that the laws in the US and the kinds of policing that we're seeing in the United States really um, emerged in the time of Jim Crow, right? I don't know if you all are familiar, but Jim Crow laws in the Southern United States really made life uninhabitable um, and really difficult for black people once they were freed from enslavement. Um, and these laws and practices in essence were to um, control black people, control black bodies, to really keep them um, oppressed even though they were supposedly quote unquote free. Um, and so policing actually emerged in the context of um, this kind of post-slavery um, time period. What we're seeing in this time period right now and the emergence of a more, um, a more complicated narrative is what's happening actually. So in the 80s and 90s, what we saw was a divestment in the public safety net. There were tremendous gains made by black people and their allies in the civil rights movement. So in the 60s, 70s, we saw a lot of really incredible gains. We saw the black liberation struggle in the United States as well as around the world really, um, really move a, pr a profound human rights agenda and really have some very concrete wins. Um, unfortunately, what happened was that in the 80s and in the 90s, there was a concerted effort to undermine the gains that black people and their allies um, made. And so we saw the divestment in the public safety net so really key and important infrastructure for uh, black and other poor communities across the United States to get um, equal footing in the US, we saw that gutted. We saw a criminalization of poverty emerge. So people were being um, demonized for being poor. Um, they were being attacked for being poor, and then they were being, they weren't given the resources to get out of poverty, right? So they weren't given the, the chance. Um, at the same time, what we saw was a criminalization of their poverty, and so an investment in criminal apparatuses. So we see the emergence of the criminal justice system as one that now we call the prison industrial complex. So not just the prisons itself, but you have pro probation officers, you have um, detention facilities for children, you have immigration detention centers, you have all of these other types of institutions, you have the courts, so it's a, it's a broader system, right? Um, that uh, various institutions that work together. Um, and we saw more of an investment in that system as opposed to investment in jobs, in uh, the healthcare system, in the education system. We saw a diversity of an investment there. Um, and this is really important for me to just share as background because in the 80s and 90s, if you remember, this is the Bush and Reagan era and they were neoconservatives and they were the ones kind of pushing this type of agenda. And even uh, folks like uh, President Bill Clinton was pushing this agenda and really divesting um, from public good. Mm -hmm. And so this all set the stage for hyper-policing, right? So what at the same time was happening were new laws and policies and new theories for how to view crime. Um, of course, you have to have the theories that kind of underpin the actual laws and so we saw the emergence of what's known as broken windows policing and this is a theory that in essence says if you see a broken window in a neighborhood you have to police that neighborhood and make sure that crime doesn't happen and so this is in essence just a way to criminalize poverty and to have police presence in poor communities instead of saying, hey, what can we do to repair the neighborhood? And hey, what does the community actually need in order to you know, correct any challenges? So 
this broken windows policing theory allows for more racial profiling to take place. It allows for low level, um, what is called acts of disorder. So jaywalking, um, sitting on a park bench, um, maybe selling Lucy's. I don't know if you heard about the story with, with, with Eric Garner who was murdered in New York for selling a cigarette. Um, it allows for police to show up for these very innocuous, not, I mean, no one cares about, like no one's worried about that. Um, but it allows for police to show up for those kinds of um, everyday things that people are doing. Um, and oftentimes what you that happens and what's been catching a lot of um, attention in the, the news and the media is that these interactions with police are escalating. Yeah. Um, and sadly, they're escalating and sometimes leading to actual murders at the hands of police, right? Um, and this is really a result of this broken windows theory that says more police is better, we're gonna have more and more and more, and they're funneling billions of dollars into policing and allowing for police to, to control um, and to brutalize our people with impunity. And so that's really what we're seeing all across the United States. This broken windows theory has been promoted all across the country. And so, you know, even recently, pro this young brother, uh, Charlie, in Los Angeles, he was murdered. He was a poor, homeless African um, brother from the Cameroon. And he was also, you know, kind of a victim of the system, right? He migrated here, um, was held in immigration detention center. He had a mental health issue. And because of his mental health issue and a number of other factors, he was not deportable, but he was left to live on the streets. And eventually LAPD killed him. Um, and this is the assault that our people are facing on you know, every single day. Just heard another story of a young brother, um, David Felix in New York City, um, Haitian brother, queer, and he was murdered by New York Police Department just recently, just I think three weeks ago. Um, and, you know, poor black immigrant living on the streets, LGBTQ community identified, and also murdered. And so we're seeing the assault on black, poor people. And, um, and then we're also seeing the resistance, which we can talk about as well. Um, myself and Alicia Garza and Patrice Coulours actually started uh, Hashtag Black Lives Matter as a political project. And we started it as a political project actually um, after Trayvon Martin was murdered and his murderer, George Zimmerman, was let free. So he was found not guilty, he was acquitted, and we were incredibly outraged. Um, we all have brothers. We all have siblings, sisters, cousins, people that we love, loved ones, um, that we just knew that if this type of violence could be happening in our communities and go unchecked, um, that we had to create something that would respond to that. And the reality was that we knew that the system, so the criminal justice system, or the criminal legal system, or for us, we also call it the punishment system, um, doesn't really provide justice for black people, period. It doesn't really provide the type of justice that we are looking for. And the reality is the only justice that we were really seeking is for black people not to be killed um, and that this would never ever happen again. And one guilty verdict is not going to solve this problem. Um, every 28 hours, a black person who is unarmed is murdered in the United States by a police officer, by a vigilante or a security guard. And that's happening many times with impunity. And we see this as a, as a pandemic. And so we created Black Lives Matter in 2013 to really respond to this pandemic that was happening in our society. Um, we saw that Black Lives Matter was not solely about police brutality, so I, I think that's kind of a misunderstanding that people sometimes have. We saw it actually as a way to say like, hey, we're really concerned, obviously, about the murders that's happening in our communities, but we're also concerned about structural uh, racism, 
we're really concerned about how structural racism is allowing for ongoing violence to our communities. So poverty is violent. Having substandard education is violent. Um, having women um, not being paid the same way as black women, not, you know, that is violent. All of these types of things um, are violent in our context and for our people. And so for us, it was an opportunity for us to say, um, we're not going to just focus solely on, on, on uh, police brutality, although it's incredibly important, but let's open up the conversation to talk about every sphere of black life. Um, let's talk about mental health and what's happening with our people. Let's talk about um, disease and care. Let's talk about all of those things. And so um, that's what we did. We, we created the Black Lives Matter as a political project. Um, but we've, it's also emerged. So we now actually have a national network and it's very extensive. So we have about 24 chapters across the country and then we have two in other countries now. Um, and the chapters really emerged after we had what we called um, the Black Lives Matter Freedom Ride to Ferguson. So you all likely have heard, but uh, Mike Brown was murdered in Ferguson, uh, in Missouri last year in 2014, August 9th. And soon after that, we organized a ride of 500 black people from all across the country. I think within the span of two weeks, uh, my, my friends and colleagues, Patrice Cullors and, and Darnell Moore basically put this call out and said, hey, we see our, our brothers and sisters who are in the streets, who are being met with tear gas, with violence, um, they're People are trying to silence them. They're mourning in the streets very visibly. They're taking um, direct action very courageously. Um, and they're being met with violence. And so, so we wanted to show up and go there. We want to mourn with them. We want to um, build with them. And so as a result of our time in Ferguson, people from across the country said, we want to build out chapters. We know that Ferguson is everywhere. And we know that it's really important for us to go back home and work in our communities. People are, people are dying across the, the country um, and people are f experiencing everyday injustice all across the country. So it's really important for us to be organized within our communities. And so now we have these chapters that are across the country. So Black Lives Matter is, is both a political project, right? And this social movement that we're seeing all across the globe but it's also a very concrete network of, of people who are doing amazing work um, from political education to campaigns to the direct actions that you're seeing um, on the news. I mean, I would, I would just say some of our accomplishments are the fact that we now actually have a network. So beyond just an online platform, which a lot of people associate, and I think it's great. We use online uh, platforms to communicate with the world and to communicate amongst ourselves um, and to really shift the narrative, right, to name anti-black racism specifically, because there's been a tendency for um, our society not to, to want to address what's happening specifically to black people. And for us, it was really important to be very explicit about how acutely black people are f experiencing injustice in this day and age. I mean, in the 21st century, we have a multiracial society, of course, right? But all across the board, we still see black communities suffering, in many cases, like the worst. And so it was really important for us to have that named explicitly. And so I think, you know, in part, part of the, the accomplishment is that we've been able to have a very explicit conversation about race, but more specifically about anti-black racism. And beyond that, the chapters that we've developed across the country, I think having actual people who are willing to do um, the work of building community of resistance and building a community of resilience is incredibly powerful. Um, and within less than a year, that network is thriving. Um, and, and every day we're kind of being reached out to by, by people in the community who want to get involved. And so it's just been really incredible. And then we've seen um, other types of things. So we've seen the creation of community uh, citizen review boards. So this is 
community members having more participation in oversight um, of the police departments. We've seen other types of campaigns emerge like let's stop the militarization of police. So police in the U.S. have all sorts of military grade equipment. Um, I think about New York City and what, from what I know, and I, that's where I live, it's the seventh largest military force in the world um, based on its equipment, based on how many cops we have there. And so myself and a number of other people in the U.S. Um, and specifically in New York City have created a campaign called Safety Beyond Policing where we're, we're flipping it on the head, its head, right? We're saying we have to define safety for ourselves. And safety looks like having access to a good job. Safety looks like um, having mental health services or services for homeless people. Safety looks like not being harassed if you jump the turnstile because you can't afford to pay for your train ticket. Um, so for us, it's really important for us to, to rename what um, reclaim and rename what, what it is for us to be safe. Um, and the other thing that I think is really important about this campaign is that it's a campaign that's explicitly about reducing the number of police in New York City. They are trying to invest $100 million each year for the next three years in hiring 1,000 new cops in New York. So we have campaigns that have been emerged from Black Lives Matter, from my organization, the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, and a number of other groups um, like Million Hoodies who've said we have to create new campaigns around the type of world that we want to see and around the type of values that we hold. And so I think that's to me is, is also really important, having visionary campaigns. Um, and that's, you know, in part some of our accomplishments. And then I think lastly, I, I would also mention, we've seen the ways in which the White House has now had to respond, right? So we, we see them going into Ferguson and releasing reports. Um, we see them meeting, uh, President Obama meeting with some of the activists and organizers that we work with all across the country. Um, and the, all of that wouldn't have happened had it not been for the courageous people who were willing to risk their lives to be in the street to take direct action um, and to stand up for human rights and dignity for all people. I think it was really important for you know, Black Lives Matter to come out how it did, right? And to, to be kind of the umbrella. Um, but the creation of additional hashtags around specific days of action has been really important to ensure that the complexity um, of our movement is really understood and that um, people don't get invisibilized as we're doing the work. So what's happening with Black Lives Matter is oftentimes people don't know that it was started by three women, right? Um, they may not know the breadth of our vision. And so it was important for us to collaborate with other organizations like the Black Youth Project, like the African American Policy Institute, um, and, and many other groups to do days of action like Say Her Name, um, which was incredible. And I'm so glad that you all have heard about that um, because it was a day to really uplift the black women and girls who are both maybe transgender or cisgendered who've been murdered also by police. Oftentimes what happens is that the names of young boys or men are the ones that make the news, right, the headlines. And, you know, important, absolutely important. Everybody, though, is important. And everybody's life is valuable. And we're here for all black lives. And so for us, it was just really important for us to, to have a day where we could say, like, say her name. Let's, let's also name the women who've been killed. Let's name the girls who've been killed. Um, and we just didn't want folks to get lost in that. And so we helped to, uh, to build out the, the day of action. Um, to ensure that all of our lives are recognized, while still you know leading with the Black Lives Matter kind of umbrella, but it was it's really important to have those distinct days of action, and to integrate it to our overall like ongoing actions. So for Black Lives Matter, in our own leadership, we prioritize trans uh, Black leadership. We prioritize women. We prioritize queer. We prioritize immigrants, like that is part of who we are. Differently abled people are part of our community. And so 
Um, many people might not know the details of our own leadership structure, but this kind of days of action allow for folks to understand what we embody and we are you know, challenging our society to really um, be more open to hearing more complex stories about who we are. Um, and the reality is we're, we're looking to make a movement that's home for everybody, that feels comfortable and good and is advocating for all of us. And so sometimes it's going to be important for us to, to, to create particular days of action just to ensure that those voices and those experiences aren't getting lost in the, the mainstream. The next steps, um, I think, you know, we have to continue the everyday work of organizing. Um, so that to me looks like community building and having more chapters across the country. So um, that is really, I think, where we're heading, right? So we're really trying to dig in deep and build out our base, right? Our base of black community members who are educated on the on the politics, educated um, and feeling empowered to express the values that they hold and to shift the culture as well as the policy that the United States has. I think additionally to that, we have to be making these global connections. I'm really excited to be here um, in Germany because I think we have to move our conversation to the global. Black people all across the world are being oppressed, even on the continent of Africa, if not the worst kind of, you know, more explicit kind of um, anti-black racism against a particular content in terms of foreign policy. Um, and so I think that's where we're, we're really headed. And part of my, my goal as being, you know, a woman who also has Nigerian roots is really to make this conversation really global. Um, and connect with our brothers and sisters in, in different contexts. And also to recognize the privilege that I might have as a person who's born in the West and has citizenship in the US. You know, I think that there's also um, some more complex conversations to be had about the role of US American black folk um, and what our positioning and privilege is in a global conversation about anti-black racism. So I think We've just got to organize, we've got to be connected with more of our people. The reality is that we're trying to build a multiracial democracy that works for all of us, and we need the entire community to be there with us in order to ensure that Black Lives Matter everywhere.